Welcome everyone, my name is Nathan Richards. I'm the um, program head for the Maritime Heritage Program here at the UNC Coastal Studies Institute. Welcome to the UNC Coastal Studies Institute, especially given that we have such a nice day. We, um, it normally affects our attendance because you're all at the beach. But um, I'd, before I really introduce Mary Habstrit tonight, there's sort of a story here and that is that we've been working on a shipwreck in Rodanthe and for a long time we didn't know what it was and my best leads were or kind of I hoped it was, a, a buoy tender, because I think these are amazing vessels. They're unsung sort of heroes of coastal navigation. They did a lot of things, and, and Mary will talk to you about that tonight. But um, I was able to visit, um, go up to Manhattan and visit the lilac, and Mary gave me the, uh, the, the tour to the deepest, darkest, darkest depths of the hull, and it was fantastic seeing the construction of the vessel. And um, I just think it was a great, a great topic. So. In talking with Mary, she was nice enough to offer to come down and talk about um, the, these vessels and specifically about the Lilac Preservation Project. So Mary is the director of the, of the project and tonight she's going to uh, give us a presentation about, about the vessel. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming, especially on such a nice day. Um, at the Lilac, our attendance actually goes up when it's sunny. Um, so. Uh, it's, it's opposite here. You've got that, that great landscape outside to enjoy in all these beaches. So um, the Lighthouse Tender Lilac was built for the US Lighthouse Service. The Lighthouse Service traces its history back to 1789 when Congress created the Lighthouse Establishment as part of the Treasury Department. This civilian agency grew to construct and care for a nationwide system of buoys, lightships, and range lights in addition to lighthouses. Tenders like Lilac tied this network of aids to navigation together. They brought replacement parts, paint, oil, coal, wood, and any other supplies that the keepers needed to maintain their lights. Tenders transported keepers to their lighthouses along with their families and personal property. They carried lighthouse inspectors. Lightships, which in the early days did not have engines, had to be towed on or off their stations by tenders. Another principal duty of the lighthouse tender was inspecting, repairing, and replacing navigational buoys. There we go. I think all the technology is working. Isn't that great? Um, Lilac was contracted for on August 16, 1931. Her keel was laid at the Pusey and Jones shipyard in Wilmington, Delaware on August 16, 1932. Lilac is the oldest and most intact American lighthouse tender afloat. She was the last ship in the Coast Guard fleet to run on reciprocating steam engines and still retains her original propulsion plant. There are two other tenders that survive from the lighthouse service. Both are younger. The first steam engines were replaced with diesels long ago and she's been altered inside to serve as a yacht and has been for sale for some time in San Francisco. So you could buy your own lighthouse tender if you want to. The Maple was built for di with diesels for service on the Great Lakes and was recently reported to be semi-abandoned in Milwaukee and covered with graffiti. Lilac was built in Wilmington, Delaware along her sister ship Arbutus. All lighthouse and buoy tenders until recently had such flowery names, a tradition that started around the time of the Civil War. Immediately after the war, the U.S. Lighthouse Service acquired several small Navy steam vessels, four of which already had flower names. They retained those names and started this tradition of naming all future tenders after flowers, shrubs, and trees. I recently met a retired Coastie who had worked on the sagebrush out of Puerto Rico. Other names include the oak, tulip, violet, and mistletoe. Modern buoy tenders in the keeper class are named for lighthouse keepers, like the Catherine Walker, which now patrols New York Harbor, and so that's my, my lighthouse tender in New York. She's named for the keeper of the Robins Reef Lighthouse near Staten Island. Lilac was launched on May 26, 1933. Christy Putnam was the sponsor who christened the ship that day. This is considered a real honor for the woman who's chosen, and it always is an honor bestowed on a woman in the case of military ships. Her father was George Putnam, who's here on the left. He was the commissioner of lighthouses. Putnam led the lighthouse service from 1910 to 1935, a period of expansion and modernization. 
He was known for demonstrating great courage of conviction by hiring the most competent people, chosen slowly on their record and their merits without regard to patronage. And the thing was that at this time, most of those jobs went to friends of government officials. So it was a real change of pace for them. He introduced benefits such as annual leave, paid sick leave, and a retirement system for Lighthouse Service employees who previously had no such benefits. Upon his retirement, he said, I am proud to have been able to help in making less hazardous the, voyage of the voyages of those who go down to the sea in ships. Here Lilac is going down the ways into the waters of the Delaware. Lilac is 174 and a half feet long with a 32 foot beam. Her riveted steel hull is painted black like all work boats, including tenders, but also icebreakers and tugs. This hides the bumps and scrapes that are an unavoidable part of their work. The hulls of Coast Guard cutters whose primary function is law enforcement and inspection are painted white. Lilac was assigned to the 4th Lighthouse District covering Delaware Bay and its approaches north to Trenton. She was originally based in Edgemore, Delaware, just north of the mouth of the Christina River. And this photo, you'll see um, as we go through her history that things change. But at this point, she has the one mast, and she's got the lighthouse service emblem on her hull. You'll see that better in another photo. And there's wooden windows all up and down here. And you'll see all those things will change later. One of the things that we have from the lighthouse service is the ship's bell. This remains property of the Coast Guard, although we got it from a former crew member who had rescued it. He loaned it to the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum in New York before he gave it to us, and the Coast Guard found out about it and tracked us down. They threatened to send the Coast Guard Investigative Service, actually. We had to prove we were a legitimate museum to keep it, and we now have it on long-term loan. It's mounted on the mast in front of the pilot house where it belongs, and we ring it on special occasions. On July 1, 1939, the Lighthouse Service was dissolved and responsibility for tending aids to navigation was transferred to the Coast Guard and Lilac became part of the Coast Guard fleet. All named Coast Guard vessels over 65 feet in length are called cutters to honor the original revenue cutters. So Lilac became the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Lilac. Like the Lighthouse Service, the Coast Guard traces its beginnings to the early days of our republic. Alexander Hamilton, the first secretary of the Treasury, recognized the need for a floating police force to ensure that foreign ships were paying duty on their cargo. So he requested funding from Congress for the first revenue cutters. On August 4, 1790, Congress authorized him to create a maritime service <coughs> to enforce customs laws. Coasties are very proud of their branch of the military, having been in continuous existence for longer than the U.S. Navy because the Navy was dis disbanded for a while after the Revolutionary War. This photo came to us from the family of the first captain, Andrew J. Da Davidson. Captain Davidson was appointed captain of the Lilac while she was still under construction in 1932, and he remained at the helm until his retirement in 1938. Since the ship is dressed with signal flags and flying the Union Jack, right here, this is some kind of special day. They, they really dress the ship up. Um, I at first thought this was possibly a ceremony to hand the ship off from the Lighthouse Service to the Coast Guard, but since Captain Davidson retired in 1938 and the transfer happened in 1939, that's not what was going on here. But I don't know what was going on. Um, we, we use the pictures a lot in telling the story of the ship, but we can't solve all the mysteries. Maybe I'll solve this one someday. Um, one thing you can see here better than in the previous photo is the Lighthouse Service emblem. And you'll see these portholes um, get covered up later. The Coast Guard comes under command of the Navy in wartime. During World War II, Lilac was camouflaged with gray paint, had a 3-inch 50 caliber gun installed on the forecastle head. You can see that here. The, fo the forecastle had to be reinforced to hold the gun, which weighs about seven tons. She was equipped with depth charges mounted in racks at the stern and two 20-millimeter anti-aircraft guns on the afterhouse roof. 
And those are here. They're pointed upward and covered in canvas for storage. To detect U-boats, she had sonar added. And to protect her from mines, a degaussing system was installed. I like to describe the degaussing gear as a cloaking device because almost everyone has seen Star Trek. It reduces the magnetic signature of the hull so that magnetic mines can't detect it as she passes by. There are gauges on the bridge and the remnants of a diesel generator in the engine room that were part of this system. Water tanks were also extended to allow for longer patrols. During the war, Lilac continued her usual duties, as you can see, by all the buoys on deck and on the dock, but she was specially equipped and her crew was on the alert for anything out of the ordinary. In 1948, Lilac's base in Edgemoor, Delaware was closed and she was assigned to Gloucester City, New Jersey, across the Delaware River from South Philadelphia. She was based there for the rest of her active duty. The site was originally built to process immigrants during World War I, but it became a Coast Guard station in 1945. The city took possession of the station in 1988 when the Coast Guard moved its base to Philadelphia. A few years ago, the city installed this plaque commemorating the pier's history, including its use by lilac. Prior to 1941, Coast Guard ships were only identified by name. During World War II, the Coast Guard started using Navy designations for some of its vessels, and the letter W was chosen to identify the Coast Guards. After the war, unique hull numbers were assigned to Coast Guard vessels, and I just realized this information is a little wrong. I've been seeing things on the big screen that I haven't always noticed in these photos, and the photo where she was painted gray before has the number 227 with no W on it. Um, so the numbering was already in use during the war. Um, but we do use the, the way the number is displayed in these photos to help us date the photos if we don't have that information from somewhere else. So the letter designations were expanded later to classify the vessel types more specifically. And WAGL was used for ships like Lilac to identify them as auxiliary vessels, lighthouse tenders. In 1966, the WAGL designation was changed to WLM, standing for medium or coastal buoy tender. So that's why we can use those to help date the photos. If you compare this photo to the first one I showed you, you'll notice that a second mast has appeared back here. And the windows on the main deck have been changed to portholes. Remember all those wooden windows? And some of these doors have been changed to hatches. Um, some of them were designed to be watertight doors, but they did not actually include the watertight mechanism. And I think that's because in the engine room, they just had the doors open all the time because it was way too hot with the steam engines running. Um, but they, it, the doors there have no insulation, and they, have the, they don't have the watertight wheel installed that keeps them against the gasket. Um, so these are just some examples of the many changes made over the years. She was in service for 40 years. One of the things we had to decide for restoration purposes was what period to restore the ship to, to 1933 or 1972 or somewhere in between. And because of the many changes that built up over time, we decided to use the 1960s as our restoration period because then all those changes can be part of the story and we also don't have to work to put things back since some of the changes are structural. There's um, a beautiful stainless steel galley that was put in in the 1960s. We'd have to tear out those cabinets and go back to galvanized iron if we wanted to be authentic to an earlier period. So, um, so it, it, it saves us some work. And also, since several of our veterans are still around from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we're collecting photos and stories from them. And so we have the most information about that later period, too. In the children's book Lightship by Brian Floca, Lilac is shown bringing the mail to the lightship Ambrose. Now, Ambrose was the lightship on New York Harbor. She never brought mail to the Ambrose, but the artist did use W227 on the hull of the tender that brought the mail to the Ambrose. Um, but those are the kind of, that is one of the things that a tender would bring to a lightship or a lighthouse. Anything that needed to be delivered would come on the tender. That could even include portable libraries. They had libraries in, in little crates that they would move around from one lighthouse to another so that the keepers had something to read on a slow day. 
The tender's crews also help the keeper with major repairs to the lighthouse. Now all lighthouses are automated and a buoy tender checks them about once a year. And they always spent most of their time tending buoys, even when they were called lighthouse tenders. And the jobs there include painting the buoys, changing light bulbs and batteries, and resetting the buoys that had been moved by storms, ice, or collisions. This is Brandywine Shoal Lighthouse in the late 1950s in a photo taken by Lilac's captain, Lieutenant John Midget. And John's son, Ray, is here in the audience. Uh, he's the one who gave me these photos to use in our research. It's about 10 miles from the mouth of Delaware Bay, and in the mid-1960s, the Coast Guard flagship Eagle ran aground on Brandywine Shoal, and Lilac was one of the ships called to assist. According to former crew member Mike Kelly, the Sassafras got there first, and Lilac turned back. But I'd really like to be able to say that Lilac rescued the Eagle. That didn't happen. Um, this is Ship John Shoal Lighthouse, which marks the north side of the ship channel in Delaware Bay. It's another of the lights once tended by Lilac, and you can see some of her crew atop the tanks, helping to deliver fresh water and fuel in 1970. This is a photo that I got from our veteran, Mike Rankin. Lilac was designed with a shallow draft to enable her to work around the shoals and underwater obstructions that such aids to navigation were marking. Lilac's draft was 11 feet fully loaded with fuel and cargo, and is nine and a half feet now when she's riding light. The elbow of cross ledge light was wrecked when hit by the ore carrier Steel Apprentice on October 20th, 1953. Um, this was during thick fog when the ship had lost her radar. Lilac responded and this photo of the aftermath was taken from her wheelhouse. The, this light, also on the north side of the ship channel in Delaware Bay, had been struck glancing blows by ships often enough that it said the keepers slept in their life jackets. By 1951, it had been automated, and there were no keepers on site when this damage occurred. A Secretary of Commerce once wrote of lighthouse tenders, this is a fleet of vessels whose duty it is to go where no other vessels are allowed to go, and who, through storm, darkness, and sunshine, do their work for humanity. Mariners have a long tradition of helping each other. But Congress recognized the need to ensure assistance to ships in distress in 1837 when it officially assigned search and rescue responsibilities to the Revenue Cutter Service. And this has continued to be a key duty of the Coast Guard that is one of its most well-known responsibilities. Buoy tenders going about their regular duties often were the first upon the scene when a vessel was in distress and were equipped with firefighting and rescue equipment. Lilac responded to several disasters during her career, including the collision between the tankers Phoenix and Penn, Massachusetts, near the entrance to the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal on June 6, 1953. Although the oil tanker Phoenix was empty, it exploded on impact and broke in two. The Penn, Massachusetts was loaded with gasoline and burst into flame. The explosions could be heard in Wilmington, roughly 20 miles from the sandbar in New Jersey, where the Pan Massachusetts drifted and burned furiously. The Chester, Pennsylvania Times reported that the surrounding waters were also aflame with gasoline. In spite of the danger, Coast Guard vessels and small craft from riverfront points as far from the explosion as Philadelphia, which I calculate was about 45 miles away, responded to the rescue call and began taking burned and oil-soaked seamen from the water. Lilac served as a command post in the search for survivors. There were 86 men between the two ships. 40 were injured and at least one died. With the transfer of the U.S. Lighthouse Service to the Coast Guard, steps were taken to simplify buoy types and designs for more efficient service. By 1944, the Coast Guard had reduced the 170 different types of buoys to a total of 41. That still represents a large number of different models that crews had to be prepared to service. Maintain, maintaining buoys has always been and continues to be one of the dirtiest and most dangerous jobs in the Coast Guard and requires a well-trained crew operating from ships and boats specially designed and built for this purpose. The sides of lilac are nearly vertical to make handling buoys easier. 
She was built to be extremely stable so she could lift buoys weighing up to 14 tons. Her steam-powered boom is rated for 40,000 pounds or 20 tons. The buoy in this photo is estimated to weigh 18,000 pounds by itself with an additional 20,000 pounds in the anchor chain and concrete sinker that held her in place. And that puts it nearly at the limit of our boom. And you can see it looks like the ship's listing just a bit. So next, um, I'm going to run a short video. This is a um, film from 1969 that we had converted. We'd gotten it from Jim Fetters, who was one of our executive officers. And you can see they're busy maintaining the buoy um, by putting a new coat of paint on it. And a lot of you, um, since you live in this area, probably know the mnemonic red right return, um, where you want to keep the red buoys on your right. Oh, yeah, and the filmmaker got distracted by the hydrofoil going by. <laughs> um, but the, you need to keep the buoys painted because the color is important. And the numbers are important because it tells you which buoy you're looking at, helps you know where you are. And of course, the paint helps maintain the steel structure from rusting away. And that's our 1954 RCA Victor radar there. Um, but another thing you can see in this view from the wheelhouse is it was designed to give a very wide view that would allow the helmsman to see what was going on alongside and see the buoy as it was coming on board. That's the telegraph. The telegraph is one of the ways that the bridge communicates with the engine room. I often challenge visitors when they come onto the bridge to figure out how you stop the ship from there or how you start it up. And you can't. The engine room does that. And here it comes on board. And Lilac has her own YouTube channel, so we are putting things like this online. How many buoys can she fit on the deck? All right. The, the boom could be used to hoist other things, too. There's a story from one crew member that Lilac once went to assist a tug with a fouled propeller. The tug crew had been unable to disentangle the line from the prop by diving down to it. So Lilac lifted the entire tug out of the water, and that allowed them to disentangle the line and clear the snarl. Here you can see Lilac's sister ship Arbutus lifting the NYPD helicopter. The crew had to ditch the helicopter near the Statue of Liberty. Other boats rescued the crew, but only Arbutus had the might to lift the whirlybird. This print was spotted on the wall at Floyd Bennett Field but I got to talk to an Arbutus crew member who said everyone on the ship was given a print as a thank you, and his still hangs in his living room today. And of course, tending aids to navigation has to be done in all kinds of weather, even if the buoys are covered in ice. If necessary, Lilac used the steam um, by pouring steam through hoses onto the buoys to melt the ice off. Sometimes the river was covered in ice. Former crew told me that their busiest time was in the spring when ice was breaking up on the Delaware because ice would actually carry the buoys out into the bay. They needed to be put back in the right spot without GPS, using sextants and compass. Lilac also served as an icebreaker when needed. Crew member Arthur Gallant remembers being thrown out of his bunk when the ice was particularly bad. Philadelphia's Walt Whitman Bridge is visible in this photo, 
placing lilac at her birth in Gloucester City, New Jersey. And this is my favorite photo of lilac. It's taken in 1969. She is moving along nicely under steam. And you can see the racing stripe on the bow. This was a branding effort instituted by President Kennedy, who solicited the advice of industrial designer Raymond Lowy. The Commandant of the Coast Guard ordered implementation of the visual identification system in April of 1967. After our nonprofit obtained the ship, a decision was made not to repaint the bow stripe for fear she would be mistaken for an active duty ship. We've since learned that it's not really a problem for the Coast Guard and several other historic Coast Guard ships maintain the stripe, so someday we hope to put it back. And you can also see here the open buoy port. And most photos of lilac underway have the buoy port open. Um, they probably left the section of bulwark that's removable back at the dock. Um, and it has a section of removable bulwark on each side. Um, to make it easier to bring the buoys onto the deck. Lilac was decommissioned on February 3rd, 1972 in a ceremony at the Coast Guard shipyard in Curtis Bay, Maryland, near, near Baltimore. The well-dressed officer in the foreground is the last chief engineer, Willie Williams. He's going to come up later. And we were worried, or I was worried, when I saw this photo that that plaque included one of our missing steam gauges. <laughs> but Will, Willie has told me they were all on the ship when he left her. So um, I'm hoping it's just a random clock and not part of the ship. And this is um, also a favorite photo of mine. I really like the gangway banner and I'm hoping we can uh, replicate that for our brow. In 1972, steam engineer and historian Conrad Milster toured Lilac on a farewell tour organized by the Steamship Historical Society in America. This is the only photo that he took that didn't include the engines. But that's fortunate for us in restoring the engine room. We've been relying on his photos both um, for color, color ch choices for the paint um, and also to tell us what parts are missing. Here you can see our electrical switchboard, which we still use, and one of the steam-driven DC generators. The entire electrical system on board was DC originally, and much of it still is. We currently run on AC shore power and have a rectifier to convert some of that to DC. And this is the portside triple expansion engine. The term refers to the three cylinders, which get gradually bigger to get as much work out of the steam as possible. The small one at this end is the high pressure cylinder, and that's where the steam enters the engine. Then it's vented to the intermediate cylinder, and then to the low pressure cylinder, and then on out to the condenser. And what they're trying to do is get as much work out of the steam as possible, but with each revolution each cycle through a cylinder, it's losing a bit of pressure and so you need more surface area to do the same amount of work. Each of our engines is 500 horsepower. In May of 2016, we were able to crank this engine over for the first time since 1972 and it can now be run briefly on compressed air. We don't have a big enough compressor to run it longer, but we can turn it over. Visitors are allowed to move the reverse and the throttle, the controls that you see here in the, oops, I hit the wrong button. Ah. Sorry about that. Oops, there we go. So um, there's one set of controls for each engine, and the outer one is the reverse, and the inner one is the throttle, which changes the speed of the engine. Um, oops. This is the condenser, and since the ship worked in salt water, they were trying to conserve the fresh water that they used for steam. So the steam was exhausted to the condenser, cooled, and then recycled to the boiler. You don't necessarily see condensers on steamships that run in fresh water. Also in the lower engine room, which we don't open to the public, 
you can see the connecting rods that join the pistons to the crankshaft. We keep the lights on in the lower engine room so visitors can look through the floor to the space below. We also run a video showing a triple expansion engine operating and sometimes run a model on compressed air. It's a small, small model, goes really fast, um, that is a model of a triple expansion engine. And this lets them get an idea what would be happening in that room if the engines were running. In 1939, reciprocating steam engines were already nearly dead tech. So one question we've asked is, why did Lilac still have those? They were already building diesel-powered ships and steam turbine-powered ships by 1933. The triple expansion engine continued to see widespread use in commercial vessels and ferries after they were mostly eliminated otherwise in the 20s and 30s from military ships. The triple expansion engines built for Liberty ships in World War II were some of the last and were chosen because specialized metal alloys for the turbines were in short supply and they still had people who knew how to build reciprocating engines. So they took advantage of that. The choice of this type of engine for Lilac may have been largely a desire for the dependability offered by tried and true technology. But another reason is likely that these engines can run equally fast in reverse as forward and that provides more maneuverability. And maximum maneuverability was really important for a ship that needed to get up close to lighthouses and buoys that are in dangerous places. She was never built to be fast. She needed to be strong and maneuverable. Her top speed was about 11 knots or 13 miles per hour. I mentioned the steam gauges that were missing. All of these are gone. Um, if anyone knows who's got a lilac steam gauge, let me know. Um, we have salvaged some clocks, so we do have a clock in the engine room. Um, and we have a couple of gauges that are the right size, but they're not the ones with the lilac name on the front like these have. After the ship was decommissioned, Lilac became dormitory and classroom space at the Harry Lundeberg School of Steam Seamanship in 1972. This school, run by the Seafarers International Union, trains merchant mariners who crew commercial ships. SIU made few alterations other than painting equipment that the Coast Guard would have kept polished. They did add electric heat since they weren't running the steam engines. Beyond that, we don't actually know very much about this period. We don't have any photos. I've run into a couple of cadets who trained on board with SIU. They haven't been good about staying in touch. Um, so that's another chapter that we still hope to fill in. The owner after SIU was Henry Hook, who had a small marina in Fallen Creek, Virginia, where he kept lilac. He let people buy bits off of her, resulting in much of the brass and copper parts having disappeared by the time our nonprofit got the ship. These folks kept a pontoon boat near Lilac in this marina. The fellow is a marine engineer who bought one of the voice tube mouthpieces for $10. You'll hear more about that later here. Lilac's after house was being rented out as a real estate office. And that's why in the after house section of the ship, there are two working bathrooms and AC lighting. Henry passed away and his wife Betty put the ship up for sale in 2002. Some ship nuts in New York saw it listed for sale and knew it was a ship that needed to be saved. In March 2003, Lilac was sold to the Tug Pegasus Preservation Project, a nonprofit that already existed and was willing to take temporary ownership. The ship cost $25,000. The sale was contingent on getting a look at her hull, which meant she had to be dry docked. Jerry Weinstein, a member of the Tug Pegasus board who underwrote the project, and Marine Surveyor Charlie DeRocco look pretty happy here with what they've seen, although an additional $250,000 was spent at the shipyard to clean Lilac up and paint her hull and exterior. The propellers were removed for the long tow in order to reduce drag. They currently sit on Lilac's buoy deck, and visitors often ask me if they're spares. They also often ask about these big chunks that are missing from a couple of the blades. What did she hit? We don't know. Minor repairs were made to the hull because she'd been in fresh water for quite a while, fortunately, and she was repainted. 
The sail included everything on board. So the hold had to be cleared of things like moldy school chairs. But the shelves of spare though rusty engine parts stayed. And off to New York she went. After a brief stay in Red Hook, Brooklyn, while the berth was prepared, Lilac moved to Pier 40 in Hudson River Park on December 31, 2003. The Lilac Preservation Project was formed a few months later, and ownership was transferred to the new organization, dedicated exclusively to restoring this ship. Although the ship was open for special events at Pier 40, and by chance when the executive director was on board, she was not open to the public on a regular basis until our move to Pier 25 in Tribeca six years ago. This pier was rebuilt specifically to host historic ships. The birth costs us a dollar a year as long as we're offering public programs. And of course we want people to know about the ship too. So we do do public programs and the most efficient way for us to do that with one employee and all volunteers is to partner with other um, organizations. And this shows you a furniture making workshop that was run by staff from the Queens Hall of Science. And it resulted in furniture that we actually put to use as part of the floating library, which was an art installation that we hosted in 2014. And making the deck into a floating library was really popular. For months afterwards, people stopped by asking if the floating library was going to reopen. But the most important thing we do is tell visitors about the ship. We always have a docent in the engine room to talk about the work that went on there and one on the bridge to discuss communication and navigation. We host historical exhibits, which so far we've been borrowing from other sources because of our staffing limitations. In this case, we brought in an exhibit on slavery and slave ships borrowed from the Mel Fisher Maritime Museum in Key West. We've also borrowed an exhibit on the Coast Guard's role in the War of 1812 from the Coast Guard Historian's Office. This year, we hosted an exhibit on shipwrecks of New York State uh, lakes and rivers that was borrowed from New York Sea Grant. And then we added our own component on wrecks of New York Harbor. So we have started to do some curating of our own. More often, we do art or photographic exhibits. Um, I was aware that a lot of artists don't have space to show their work if they're not well known. And this works for us because they're not only providing content, but often they're donating their time to hang the work and even staff the ship to help make sure people see it. This particular exhibit was a series of photos of dancers on historic vessels. And the photos were mounted in many of the spaces on board. Um, the most creative installation was this big print in the engine room. But we even had a print in the officer's head for that one. Um, and we let the artists have a lot of leeway that way, as long as they're not putting any holes in the ship or causing any other damage. We use magnets to hang most things because it's a steel ship. The Lilac Art Series two years ago showed work inspired in some way by the ship's history or our work there in restoring her. There was a great video of a cloud making machine that mimicked the steam that the ship once exhausted. And another projected a video onto the floor of the PO quarter so it looked like you were looking through the hull down into the water. Um, another one of my favorites from this exhibit was the steam bent wood sculpture, which hung in the engine room. And a new activity we launched um, that year was Captain Mary's Story Hour. Um, I'm a librarian by training, so this, um, and it's a lot of fun to, to get kids there and talk about the ship. At our first one, we read the book Fireboat by Myra Kalman, and families got a ride on the retired fire department fireboat John J. Harvey afterwards. One of our volunteers does uh, scrimshaw demonstrations and knot tying lessons. So we're also continuing those maritime skills and crafts. We also host lectures and presentations. This one was a book reading from veterans memoirs that featured our volunteer rigger Jimmy and his twin brother Moro, both Vietnam vets. And while all that's going on, we're still working to maintain and restore the ship. The plan is to operate her on steam again. And a couple of years ago, we started work on the port side engine, and then it stopped for a bit. But um, we had some steam locomotive engineers come in and open the cylinders up and take a look to see what condition they were in.
They turned out to actually be in very good shape. The Coast Guard laid the engines up just right. And as I said, uh, once we got back to work on this, um, our current engineer was able to uh, get that one going again. And I was hoping you were going to see some action here. But um, that's our um, air pump in the lower engine room. And that uh, pulls air out of the condenser. And it's supposed to be moving. This actually does move now. We also um, did a project to restore radiators to the ship. Um, we got a small grant for a heating boiler. And uh, although SIU had not removed radiators from a lot of spaces, they were missing from the wardroom. Um, and the heat system that SIU had put in was electric and the heat pumps that ran it, we couldn't get parts for anymore. So this was a way to solve the problem of not having heat and actually go back to something that was more like the original. The logistics of getting stuff on and off the ship when we're not allowed to bring a vehicle onto the pier is always a challenge. It's a very heavily programmed pier in park lingo. And um, we've got beach volleyball and mini golf and joggers and dog walkers and strollers and they don't want anything getting in their way. Um, and uh, they don't want any accidents from us all running into each other. So here we're moving in the new radiators for the wardroom. And each of these weighed 221 pounds. Even though, um, like I said, SIU had left most of them in place, these were missing. This is the wardroom in a historic photograph. And we used that to guide us, of course. And I think we did a pretty good job. These are the new radiators, not yet painted in the wardroom. Two years ago, we restored the capstan. And even before we replaced the oak washers, which is what's going on here, we were able to use it to move the ship in May 2014. We got short notice from the park that they wanted the ship moved off the fenders to repair the fendering system. And to save the cost of bringing in a tug for that, we cranked the ship forward with the capstan and 12 volunteers. This is what the bridge looked like not long before we purchased the ship, but by the time we got it, a number of the things you see here were gone. The binnacle compass was gone, the telegraphs were gone, the wheel stand was gone, and you can see the wheel was already missing. Um, we replaced the binnacle with one we bought from an antiques dealer. The wheel stand we salvaged from a ship in Kingston, New York, and the telegraphs came from the Navy's reserve fleet. Um, there's a program that lets museum ships go to the mothballed fleet and remove parts because if the ships were put back into service, all of those systems would be upgraded. And um, I mentioned this earlier, the mouthpiece for the voice tube. Um, one day I got an email asking if we were missing the port side voice tube. And I'm like, wow, how do you know that? Well, that guy had bought it for $10. And he found us on the internet reminiscing about the lilac found out we were restoring the ship, and he sent it back. And it's not the only artifact that's come back to us. Um, and when we get it, we put it back where it belongs, like you see here. And we just had a crew come in and um, a, a, a bunch of computer geeks who work for a company that builds apps, and they wanted to have a team building exercise and do a project together. And they came in and polished all the brass on the bridge, so it looks a lot nicer now. <laughs> Another thing that came back to us was the original wheel. Captain Homer Purdy returned that to us. He had been tasked with replacing it back in about 1968 due to a bad wobble, and they put a pipe wheel in instead. Um, and the wooden wheel, he, he tried to convince the Coast Guard base to put it up in the offices. They said, we have too many wheels, just get rid of it. So he turned it into his dining room table. And um, again, he. He found us on the internet, saw we were restoring the ship. We were talking about how do we get this big thing back? How do you ship it? And then his daughter and grandson volunteered to drive it up to us on their vacation. And then they lost their transmission in Delaware. So one of our former crew, Petty Officer Tom Knotts, who's here, he's now a member of our board, by the way. Um, he came to our rescue, answered the SOS, drove down, picked it up, brought it the rest of the way. And Jerry, our founder, prepped the salvaged wheel stand and reinstalled the wheel. And there it is. It's a really popular photo op. 
Um, we had some discussion when we put it back, how do we keep it from being damaged? Um, and my engineer disconnected everything inside so we can't damage the gears. People, so people can turn it and pretend that they're steering the ship. It's really popular. We also got the original builder's plate back from chief engineer Willie Williams. These are big collector's items. They're unique to every ship. We never thought we'd see it again. Um, I actually had to do some talking to get it, though, because he was worried he was going to get in trouble with the Coast Guard if they found out he'd taken it. And what convinced him to send it to us was the captain having the wheel. He's like, if a captain had the wheel, I'm not going to get in trouble. He put it in a, a, an express mailbox and sent it back to us. And we hung it in the engine room where it belongs with tamper-proof screws, so no one's going to take it. And we're also restoring spaces and equipment to show visitors what life and work was like for our crews. We got a grant to repaint and remediate lead paint in the petty officer's quarters. These are before and after photos. Um, and this work is still being finished up. But this is the port side ladder where you can see the change. And because this space is one of the darkest on board, there's no portholes or windows and it's below decks, we're renovating it to be used as a classroom space. Um, but also make it flexible so we can hang the bunks back up when we're doing tours of life on board. And then when we want to do a lecture, we can take the bunks down, set up um, stacking plastic chairs, and we have seating for 30 down there, and we can show a film or a slideshow like this. And this video works. Okay, um, we just got the Hobart mixer working again. They're, they're actually built like tanks, um, but uh, there it goes. And um, we need a mixing bowl. So I put this on our Facebook page and, and the, the mixing bowl on our Amazon wish list. So I'm hoping someone buys us a mixing bowl. <laughs> and I hope that Lilac's going to be steaming again someday, not too far off in the future. This, in this photo, she looks pretty good. This is the day after Hurricane Sandy with the mist rising off the river. And uh, we fortunately have a professional photographer who lives in a tower that overlooks the ship. And he's been very lovely about letting us use photos that he's taken. And this is one of my modern favorites. So, so that is the end of my information for you. So now if you have some questions, Nathan will field those Thank and you, pass Mary. them on. Thank you, Mary. Questions? How many people are on the crew? How many officers and men are on I, the crew? I, I should have known to mention that because it's one of our most frequently asked questions when we have visitors on board. The total complement was 38. Um, there were three officers in addition to the captain, who was typically a lieutenant, um, and um, three chief petty officers. And based on the bunk space, 12 petty officers and I think that ends with about 16 seamen. Mm. Um, the sailor's um, berthing is at the bow of the ship. So mm. I mentioned the guy who fell out of his bunk when they were breaking ice. That's where you feel the motion the most is at the bow. Um, all the officers are at the stern. And it's, it, there it's very hierarchical. The officers are on the top level of the after house. The chief petty officers are on the main deck. And the petty officers are below deck. How long was a typical mission, or how long did they go out for sea? It wouldn't be more than about five days. Um, they could get far enough out into the bay that they were out of sight of land, but it was a coastal tender, so it wasn't going that far. Thank you. You mentioned the other ships in the fleet. Which ones were used in this region? That is a good question, and since I've, this is my first time to the Outer Banks, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious about some of the um, engineering, as far as the uh, revolutions that the um, engine made at 500 horsepower. And uh, I guess she was uh, oil-fired? Yes, she was oil-fired. Um, they burnt bunker six 
bunkers. It's a yeah. very heavy oil that you can't even move through pipes unless you heat it up. It's like right. uh, some people say it comes out of the bottom of the refinery after they take all the good stuff out. Steam pressure to run that particular um, engine? That I don't know. My engineer might, but I'm afraid that I don't have in my head. I think I can answer the question about the uh, lighthouse tenders here. I thought you might. Good. Yeah, the uh, the Linden was was uh, worked the Pamlico Sound, Pamlico River, Noose River, Albemarle Sound in this area uh, in the 40s, and later the Arbutus, not excuse me, the Arbutus, the Verbena was the other one that was came in and out of Washington, North Carolina. There was a buoy yard in Washington. And the the light ha the buoy tenders and the lighthouse tenders would work out of there, and then they would work their way. They would also work out of uh, Hampton Roads area too. Yeah, there are actually records of the verbena being um, serviced at, in Newburn too at the Barber Boat Works. Yeah. How did you get involved in this project? How did I get involved in this project? Um, my short flip answer is that it's my husband's fault. Um, <laughs> the founder, Jerry Weinstein, who is in the photos, is the guy I'm married to. Um, however, um, we actually met at a conference of the Society for Industrial Archaeology. And I've had an interest in industrial history for a long time. Um, I've been president of the Society for Industrial Archaeology and worked for a while as their event planner where I was organizing tours of factories and um, abandoned industrial sites. And I got into preservation advocacy in New York um, because I felt like industrial sites are the underdog of preservation. Um, people will often save houses where George Washington or Edgar Allan Poe slept once, um, but saving a sugar refinery that hasn't worked in a while is a whole different kettle of fish. People look at them as derelict. Um, and uh, they're often really important to our history. It's the story of America making things. And we've gotten disconnected from it. We used to all be related to people who made things, and we're not anymore so much. And I found people are really fascinated by the stories. And so I would use my research skills as a librarian. That's what I was trained to do and worked at for a long time. And dig out those stories to help save the places. Um, I didn't have too many successes, partly because by the time you find out a place is being torn down for usually a condo development, at least in New York, um, it's usually too late to do much but a bit of tweaking to the plans. But, um, but I was doing that. and then. When uh, they had a director who had to leave, and they didn't know who would take on this incredible job. <laughs> um, and I thought, wow, this is something everyone involved is trying to save. No one's trying to sink her or tear her down. Maybe I can finally help save something that's important to our history. So that's why I'm doing it. I have a question. Um, in reading about these vessels, it's, it, really, it really sort of left the impression on me that these are supremely adaptable vessels. They did all kinds of interesting things, but one of the, the really uh, real clues to their adaptability is that they got pulled in and out of wartime contexts. And so my question is, um, when you look at the vessel today, it's, um, do you see the remnants of the wartime service? Do you see things, the scars left of the of, of the, where the weapons were mounted and things like that? I'm not so much where the weapons were mounted, um, especially the roofs are wooden and the anti-aircraft guns, for instance, were on the roof and that's probably been replaced at least once since then. Um, and and it's been, it was covered over with plywood in re just before my time. Um, but you can see a number of remnants. Um, the sonar is still on the bridge. Um, and the gauges for the degaussing system are still there. And um, although it was cannibalized, the remnants of the diesel generator for the degaussing system is there. Um, another thing is um, the reinforcement of the forecastle is very obvious. And some of the portholes in the forecastle were covered over as part of that. So you can see that in the structure. Great. 
where, when do you foresee having the steam engines operational and how much money do you think that's going to cost? Um, it, it'll only take five million. Um, and, and that is a, that's an estimate I've gotten from two different sources. That, uh, and there are people who have worked on historic ship projects in the past, so I think that's pretty accurate. And five million um, will not only get her steaming, but should have her in a, at a point where she could be an inspected vessel um, to offer excursions um, as a, a, a legal Coast Guard ship. Right now, the ship is uninspected, undocumented. Um, and so we can't charge admission, um, which is hard if you're doing public programs and you don't have an easy way like that to pay for it. Um, and um, right now, one thing that has slowed us up for a couple of years is um, all the steam pipes on board are insulated with asbestos. You can encapsulate that, but unfortunately, we have a couple places where it's in very bad condition. Um, in the boiler room in particular. Before we got the ship, the stack cover was not being maintained. There was no cover on it, which means that um, rainwater was coming right down into the boiler room. And when asbestos gets wet, it expands and kind of explodes. And the boiler room is really a mess. Um, we can't fully assess the boilers until that's gone. Um, and uh, then we can fi figure out if we can rebuild them or need to have new boilers. Um, so as far as steaming, the boilers are obviously really important. Um, and uh, we've been trying to find a spot for that work. Um, we found out that the regulations are different enough between New Jersey and New York that we can save about $25,000 going to New Jersey. And I found this out from a contractor. I'm like, cool, I have a movable work site. Um, but we haven't been able to find anyone in New Jersey that has a space that they're not busy using or where the word asbestos just scares them away. Um, so we're still trying to figure that out. And unfortunately, we've been on the verge of doing it for two years, just looking for a spot. We have funding. Um, so that's been a sticking point. I think if we were fully funded, it would still take at least three years to get her running. Uh, before I ask the online question, I guess another way to answer that would be to go to lilacpreservationproject.org and make a big donation. Sure. <laughs> uh, I have a question, uh, a question online. Um, if you get the steam engines running, where will you take her? Well, right now, since she's based in New York City, we would do excursions around the harbor and up the Hudson River. Um, the berth we have in Hudson River Park we've been getting for three years at a time. We're at the end of the latest three-year agreement. Um, I know they like our programming, and I expect that we'll be able to continue to stay there, but there's always this off chance in the future that we're going to have to go someplace else. So we have been looking at other possibilities. Um, and uh, I've been talking to Gloucester City, New Jersey, actually, which owns her base there. And uh, we also have been talking to the director of the future Coast Guard Museum. The Coast Guard is the only branch of the military without a national museum. They've broken ground for one. Um, they're still raising money. So it doesn't exist yet. But that's kind of out there as a possibility, too. And that's in New London, Connecticut. Any other questions? Do you know how much the uh, cost originally to, to build uh, the lilac? Uh, well, that certainly is findable, but no, I don't know oh, okay. that. I just wonder how it compared to the $5 million you need now. The, that, <laughs> that's a good question, though. I'm going to look that up. The, the, the ones that were being built in the 20s were about, from memory, were between three hundred and eighty and four hundred and twenty thousand dollars yeah. I think. Yeah. The other thing, I, I, you might not have tracked the dates, but I, I like to tell people who visit the ship that it only took about nine months to build her, partly because it parallels you know, uh, our human babies um, developing. But also, you look at this steel structure. It's riveted. Everything on it was made in America. And wow, they could do that in nine months? 
That's pretty cool. So did she come across any U-boats? Not that we know of, although um, we haven't tracked down her logs either. Um, some of them are in the National Archives, but um, uh, we haven't had people with time to go and really look at those. Uh, one thing I learned, though, and I was thinking, well, you know, she's on the Delaware River. How much danger really was there? But I found out in doing a bit of research on that that a third of our ships for the World War II effort were being built in the Philadelphia area, including at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. And they'd go down the Delaware and out into the Atlantic. And so the U-boats were hanging out there around the mouth of the Delaware waiting for these ships to come out to sea and knock them off before they were able to be used against them. So actually, it was, I think it was more dangerous than I expected anyway. I'd, I'd like to make one comment. I, I just wanted to share that often a good percentage, it was not uncommon for the crew members to be from Eastern North Carolina, and quite a few of them were from the Outer Banks in, in this area. Um, so, you know, the, the lilac, even though she was on the Delaware, she had a connection to Eastern North Carolina. Yeah. Well, related to that, my question would be, um, are you in touch with many people who served on the vessel, and uh, do, they, do they get in contact with you? And, uh, and do you have much to do with them? Um, I'm in touch with about 20 now. In fact, just in the past few weeks, two more have gotten in touch. Um, and um, I, I, I love talking to our veterans um, and family members of veterans um, because that gives us those stories that we're sharing. And I think it brings the ship alive. Um, we're actually having a reunion next week of our veterans. Um, I think we're only going to get six actually there. But we have arranged to bring the active duty buoy tender Catherine Walker in. They're going to open for tours for the public and for our veterans. They're coming to a reception with our veterans and our volunteers. And um, we're really making a bit of a celebration of this and videotaping all the veterans. There's a, a student filmmaker program nearby that is sending teenage filmmakers over to video them. and. Um, we also, the artist who's currently on board is, has offered to make photographic portraits of all the veterans. So they're going to sit down and get their portraits taken on board their old ship. Well, if there aren't any more questions, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for coming all this way from Manhattan to talk to us.